So for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Rafael Fierro. I teach history and government uh, at Tuxus. Been here doing that for 15 years. I also established the Civic Engagement Institute in 2017, and we have put on events like these for the better part of three semesters now. So we are looking forward to the event today. I'm sure it'll be very informative. Uh, you see the topic on the screen. And before I introduce our guest speakers, let me just say a little bit about uh, mass shootings and some of the impact that they have on our lives. Uh, first of all, uh, next year will be the 20th anniversary of the Columbine shootings. 20th anniversary. And to me, Columbine was a, a major turning point in terms of the way we look at school shootings, in terms of uh, the impact that these school shootings have on our society as a, as a cultural phenomenon as much as an individual act of violence. But it seems to me also that since Columbine, there have been many repeat occurrences of of these kinds of incidents, and uh, they almost seem to be monthly occurrences now, right? From Columbine to Pittsburgh, there have been hundreds in between, and they have had quite a lasting impact on our society. I think it's also interesting that the media has chosen to focus on these occurrences in a certain way. What's striking to me is that the media it covers these events when they happen with a tremendous amount of intensity. And then after a couple of weeks go by, just disappears. You don't hear anything about it. Okay, there are exceptions. I think the Sandy Hook shooting is an exception just because it happens so close to home. So we constantly get updates on what's happening there. We, we seem to be more informed about that event because we're from Connecticut. But overall, uh, these media events, they have a very short shelf life. They don't last very long. They disappear from the public's perspective, right? Until the next one happens, and then the cycle repeats, right? But one of the things that we wanted to do with this event today is to, is to show people that once these uh, shootings happen, they have a long-lasting impact. The scars remain long after the camera coverage stops. And I think it's important for people to know the tremendous l impact that these types of events have on people. The scars last for a lifetime. And this is why the Civic Engagement Institute likes to put on events like these. By nature, in fact, we want to be interdisciplinary. We don't want to just cover historical or political events. We want to cover these kinds of events too because they have to do with community as much as history and political science does. And so with that, I want to introduce uh, two guest speakers today. They're both from the Wheeler Clinic, which has been very good to us. We've had very good communications with them, and we thank them for being here. Erica Baloga is to the far left. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist counselor, and Kim Hollist is a licensed clinical social worker. Again, both from the Wheeler Clinic. We look forward to their expertise. They're going to talk about the kind of impact that these acts of violence have on everyday people, family members, peers, and so on. And so this promises to be a very, very good uh, presentation. And so we welcome both Erica and Kim. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you. Start. So we're gonna sit if you guys are okay with that. Poor Erica's on crutches, <laughs> um, so just wanna let you know. Um, but thank you for having us here today. I hope the information we give you is informative and educational to you all. Um, Eric and I are going to break down the presentation together. So I'm going to talk about what research shows as to why some of the school shootings do happen, and then also talk about the effects on children and adolescents. And then Erica is going to go into the effects on adults. Um, and then we'll talk about some treatment options that are helpful for those who have been victims of trauma. And then um, I will talk about my experience when I responded down to Newtown through Wheeler Clinic a little bit, um, so just to give you guys an idea of what that looked like. Okay. 
Um, so a lot of the questions that we ask is why do school shootings happen and why does it impact our country and why has it continued to grow um, within the U.S. recently in the past several years? And obviously knowing that um, what happened in Sandy Hook was very shocking and things continue to increase over time. Um, so we've done a lot of research and looking at things and research identifies that there are six common factors as to why school shootings happen and specific behaviors or um, symptoms that you may see with someone who does do a school shooting. And the first one is a biological, psychological, and social factors that they identify. Um, so they'll say that a person who is identified as a school shooter will often present as a, like a fragile self-esteem. Um, they'll have a difficult time viewing themselves in a positive light. They'll isolate themselves from others uh, where they don't have a lot of social supports and they feel like they don't have someone to back them up and um, be like an accomplice in a way to the situation. They also have some paranoid thinking too, which I'm sure some of you probably know a little bit about, um, but they'll think that there are certain people that um, have done them wrong in some way that maybe it hasn't happened. They're really not in the right frame of mind. Um, and they also, um, a lot of sc school shooters, excuse me, do not plan to survive their own attacks. Um, so I'm sure you a lot of us see in the news that they're either die by suicide within a school shooting um, or they're actually planning to be killed by a police attack in that. So just to give you an idea of where their, their head is during that time when a school shooting does happen. Thanks. <laughs> Um, another factor that research says is why school shootings happen is school bullying. And I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard about that too. Um, but it is a big factor. And school bullying can be different things. It could be physical interactions. It could be verbal. Um, it could be something over media. And uh, many gunmen had been victims of bullying in school. And they take their frustration and their anger out on other students and teachers. Um, and they call this as an injustice collector, is what they call it. Um, and they believe that in some way they've been insulted or harmed um, by other people. And they actually kind of make a mental list of who that was, why they did it. Um, and that is their goal to set up this plan to be able to plan and get their revenge. Um, so that's another piece of why they feel that bullying is a big piece to why school shootings happen. Um, research also identifies copycats. So um, once a school shooting does occur, it's very highly and very likely that another school shooting will happen within 13 days. Um, and it actually research shows it's very high. So you'll see a lot of times where a school shooting will happen and a couple days later that there's maybe someone that was stopped in a school shooting or one actually does occur. Um, and it says in research that it gives that person some kind of confidence or feel that they can be brave enough like that other person to carry out on their act or plan that they had for a school shooting. Um, and they feel like the media attention that they're getting from that school shooting that maybe they can get the same thing or they can get more, more publicity because of a school shooting that they wanna do. Um, so that's another factor. Um, research also identifies mental health concerns. So I'm sure you guys have seen in the media that mental health is a big piece as to why people say that school shootings happen, and it is. Um, but it's often suggested that a lot of the people that do school shootings have not been formally diagnosed before by like a psychiatrist or a social worker or a psychiatric nurse. They may have had some type of mental health needs and had not been treated, um, but, but I think it's about 4% they said that have actually been formally diagnosed that have done a school shooting. So it's, it's pretty um, significant and research for that too. And then another factor identified through research is the culture of violence. Um, we know that it's brought up a lot too that within media, uh, video games, movies, music, it's always highlighted that um, there's a lot of violence or things that happen in media and they feel, research feels that that contributes to why some people may become a school shooter or act out on those thoughts. Um, and it's commonly argued that exposure of children um, and young people to violent content make them more prone to committing these acts too. So that's what research suggests. And then the last common factor, which is obviously a very controversial topic in our um, country, and I know is gonna be talked in another presentation down the road, is gun control. Um, so research identifies that gun control is a big issue within our country, and they state that it's very easy to access a gun, that there's more than 15,000 gun shops within the United States, and at least one family had, or family, I'm sorry, families have at least one or more access to weapons within their homes. So they feel that because it's so easy to access weapons, it's easy to be able to carry out a school shooting. All right, 
So what happens after? You know, what happens after a school shooting? How does this impact um, kids, adolescents, and adults, and the long-lasting effects of that? Um, so specifically within my role at Wheeler, I work with children and adolescents in crisis. So for trauma especially, um, you're going to see that children act a lot like adults at times um, and have similar kind of reactions to a traumatic event. Um, but specifically for kids, you'll see that there's a lot of anger, um, there's sadness, there's shock. Sometimes there's feelings of, you know, what could I have done differently? So maybe I could have stopped my brother or sister to going to school that day, or I could have said something differently that morning to change it. Um, so there's a lot of feeling like helplessness that there's no control over the situation. Um, the child also experiences increased nightmares. They'll have um, intrusive thoughts. They'll have changes within their moods, especially for little kids. They'll even act out more. Um, they may even act out pieces of the shooting that occurred. Um, so you'll see that with younger children. Um, and they also may report some like body aches, some pains, stomach pains, headaches. Those are normal responses to a traumatic event. All right. Um, those who are especially distressed or anxious um, from the traumatic event may exhibit regressions in their development too. Um, so you may see for a child who is completely potty trained, they will start bedwetting. Um, they'll be very clingy to their parent or guardian, and they'll have frequent tantrums in response to a trauma. And then you'll see on the other side with an adolescent, you'll see some maybe anger, outbursts, um, frequent changes in their moods. They may be isolating themselves or not engaging in activities that they loved before. Um, so maybe a student that was interested in sports or activities, they may be pulling back and not engaging in those. Um, and some actually adolescents may present with suicidal thoughts and actually homicidal thoughts. So thoughts to hurt or kill themselves or hurt or kill someone else. And when that does happen and the isolation, it's really important to make sure that you get a behavioral health professional involved because that is a crisis at that time and you really need to make sure that they have someone to speak with. So, There are some kids and adolescents that experience long-term effects. Um, and that means that they're having a di more difficult time being able to process the situation and still having some effects of it over time that need to be addressed by a behavioral health professional. Um, so that if it is noticed, it's really important to co contact somebody who is uh, specialized in that area to work with them. So. Hi, um, so I'm Erica Beloga. I work at Wheeler Clinic with the adult population. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what post-traumatic st stress disorder means, how do we diagnose that, and what are some of the effects that we see on our adult population. So what I do wanna highlight is that individuals who experience a traumatic event don't always develop PTSD. So for example, if Kim and I were both involved in a car accident, she could walk away from it fine, no symptoms, carry on with day-to-day -day life. I could have a number of different symptoms. There's a lot of different factors that go into why some people develop symptoms and why others don't. Um, some of them are ability to adapt to stressors, genetics, childhood experiences, their surrounding environment, um, the ability to self-regulate using coping skills, socioeconomic factors, protective factors, and under other uh, underlying behavioral health conditions. And for individuals who do develop post-traumatic stress disorder, if it goes untreated, they could have the symptoms for years at a time. Um, I like to use this example when I was being trained um, in EMDR, which I'll talk about after. The trainer discussed a client that she had who was a World War II veteran for 40 years was having nightmares every night, flashbacks, and intrusive thoughts, again, for 40 years the person went through this treatment and was able to live a life without trauma. So it, it can go on for years. That's why treatment is very, very important. So some of the other effects um, that can happen with PTSD is disassociation. Um, I break this down into two different types. So there's depersonalization, which is when you feel detached from yourself. You almost feel as you're an outside observer watching your life. There's also derealization, um, where experiences seem dreamlike, distorted, and very distant. Um, when we go into trauma work, it's really important to explore the level of dissociation that a person could be experiencing uh, before beginning treatment because treatment can actually be counterintuitive if the symptoms are that severe. So we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. 
the most common symptom with trauma is avoidance in adults. Um, other symptoms, again, that I discussed could be nightmares, flashbacks, hypervigilance, sleep disturbances, feeling as if the event was happening again, um, a lot of intrusive thoughts, feeling emotionally numb. From a cognitive standpoint, there's also um, a lot of negative beliefs about the world. So especially for people who could be victims of a violent crime or sexual assault, they learn to believe that the world is an unsafe place and then that ends up impacting how they act out their day-to-day -day life. Uh, people can also tend to isolate, develop symptoms of depression, irritability, aggression. Um, and as Kim was saying with kids, this is the same with adults, a suicidality, they could become homicidal as well. Um, and I just, this is a fact that I believe is very important with the adult population. Over 60% of the adults who have a diagnosis of a substance use disorder also have a trauma disorder. So a lot of people end up self-medicating to try and numb some of their symptoms. And one thing that I find important, and when I'm training other clinicians, when we're doing intake assessments on individuals who have had a history of trauma, um, if they do meet criteria for PTSD, I always like to make sure that the trauma is addressed before giving additional diagnoses, because trauma can represent, it can look like depression, it can look like anxiety. So I always make sure that that's treated, and then seeing if there's another underlying mental health condition. So like I touched upon earlier, um, my role in Wheeler Clinic is a couple of things, so I can kind of start with that and then go into my Newtown experience. Um, so I'm an associate director at Wheeler, and I oversee mobile crisis services for children and adolescents. So we actually go out into the community and do crisis work with kids from birth all the way up until age of 18. Um, so kids that are at risk for suicide, homicide, um, psychosis, trauma, substance use, you name it, we cover it. Um, so when Sandy Hook had happened, um, we were actually called by the state, our mobile crisis teams, to respond down to Newtown um, and provide uh, support to the school systems there. So I was specifically stationed at the high school um, with nine other people, and then um, my managers actually were uh, stationed at Sandy Hook. So um, we were responded within about two days of the event, um, and when we did get down there, we joined a group which is called Deburn. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it. Um, but it's called Disaster Behavioral Health Resource Network. Um, and it's actually a nationwide group um, that actually responds to any types of traumas. Um, so they're made up of community members, mental health professionals, uh, DCF workers, police officers, pretty much anybody can um, assist. And they responded to things like 9-11, um, Hurricane Sandy. They've done quite a bit of trauma work. Um, so we joined forces with them when we were there, and when we worked at the high school, we got to work with students and teachers that had been affected by Sandy Hook. Um, so I worked with students that were siblings of some of the kids that had passed, or um, teachers that were dance teachers of some of the children, or basketball coaches. Um, so we really had a contact with them, maybe not directly with Sandy Hook, but a lot of those who were impacted. Um, and the type of the work that we did is really just, we did group sessions a lot and we did some individual work, but we really just met the kids and the teachers where they were at. And obviously, you know, when you start off, especially with a school shooting, you, you, they wanna know why and it's confusing and people don't understand why this happens to their town or their kids. Um, so we just took a lot of time of just listening um, and understanding. We did different activities sometimes with the kids, which was helpful that didn't really wanna talk about it. Um, so we did writing, we did drawing, different kind of arts and crafts things that were helpful. Um, they also had therapeutic dogs that came in, which was really nice and the kids loved. Um, and that took a lot of the focus off of the trauma and on the animals. And I don't know if anybody knows about therapeutic animals or anything, um, but it was really interesting to watch, because especially animals, they know when someone's struggling with sadness or anxiety, or it's just interesting to watch. And we had one girl in one of our groups who was very emotional and upset, um, and instantly the dog went over and sat down with her and knew that she was struggling, um, and stayed with her until she was in a better state. Um, so that was a really big tool I think that was helpful. Um, they would bring the dogs in like in shifts of four hours each, because like humans, dogs get exhausted and emotionally drained too. Um, so they had a little bit of that. Um, so I was there for about a month and a half, and then we had other people that stayed a little bit longer, um, and then responded back out, to, back to our bases for a crisis here. Um, so on the other side of it, you know, we came there and we worked with the kids and the teachers, but when we got back to our own home base, we worked with our staff on debriefing um, on ourselves and being able to cope too, because obviously 
you know, you have those that are victims of school shootings, but we also had some vicarious trauma from what we experienced down there too. So it's important to take care of our pieces for ourselves. So that's just a little nutshell of what to give you guys experience of that. Um, so Eric and I wanted to talk about specific treatments that are beneficial for those who have been exposed to uh, trauma or victims of a school shooting. Um, so children and adolescents have a specific type of treatment and it's called, which you guys have I think handouts um, too for, um, it's called trauma-focused uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or TFCBT. And it's an evidence-based treatment for kids and adolescents. Um, and it's shown to help kids being able to overcome trauma-related difficulties as well as their caregivers. So uh, the goal of it is to reduce negative emotional and behavioral responses following a traumatic event. And that could be a school shooting, it could be sexual abuse, it could be domestic violence, um, it could be a traumatic loss. Any type of traumatic event that's identified, this treatment is specifically used for. Um, it also addresses any distorted beliefs and attributions related to the abuse and provides a real supportive environment for that child or adolescent to just talk and be able to share their story and feel safe and comfortable in doing so. Um, it's typically a short-term type of treatment. I, don't, I know you have that on yours too, but it's usually about 12 to 18 sessions. Um, it really depends on how the child or adolescent responds to the treatment. Um, and each session is designed to build that relationship with the therapist, the child, and the parent. And then it's educating them, um, giving them skills, and then again, that safe environment to be able to address that trauma. Um, and there's a lot of joint parent-child sessions too. So I'm sure you guys know, with, even with teenagers, it's hard sometimes to be able to express how you feel to your parents because they may not understand. You may not feel like they don't understand. Um, so there's really a lot of work on opening that communication between the parent and the child or guardian and the child and being able to make it effective as possible so that child or adolescent feels comfortable going to them and feels safe, explaining how they feel. And then on that handout I gave you guys, it just breaks down uh, the key components of the trauma work, and then it gives you a definition of all of them, so just so you guys can kind of have a takeaway with that. So um, it, pretty much what I just talked about with the trauma work in there, and then what they do. So, all right. And then Erica's gonna talk about the adult side. All right, so show of hands, how many people have heard of eye movement desensitization reprocessing, also known as EMDR? A couple right. hands, awesome. Um, so EMDR is based off of the adaptive information processing model. And what that means is our bodies have a physical and an emotional way to process information. Um, so from a physical standpoint, if we get a cut, um, the wound will typically close and the body will begin to heal itself. What are some exceptions? If it's infected, irritated, picked at, then it's, it's not gonna heal. It's gonna continue to worsen. So the same um, aspect is with the emotional component. So I'm gonna give an example. Our brains are kind of like a filing cabinet. So when we have a memory, think of it as a manila folder. We have a memory, our brain goes through it, processes it, puts it away, the door gets shut. So I'm sure if I ask you guys to think of a happy memory, maybe when you got your first car, or when you future graduation, you can pick a happy memory and think about that, but it's not always on your mind 100% of the time. When a traumatic event occurs, trauma happens when the file cannot be processed properly. So it kind of sits and it floats in our brain and it doesn't get stored properly, which is how trauma symptoms develop. So the purpose of EMDR is to help get the brain networks moving again so we can file it properly. So a little bit about the biological component. Um, our experiences are held in our limbic system before it moves to adaptive processing. So if there's an experience that cannot move toward adaptive processing, it ends up sitting in our limbic system. So every time um, there's some type of trigger or a reminder, our brain activates our limbic system and this is why trauma symptoms develop. So if you think of your five senses, that's typically how the brain gets activated to become triggered when a person has trauma. Um, there's also something called hippocampal stamping, um, which cannot happen until the memory is removed from the limbic system. So the goal of that is once a memory is moved into long-term storage, a memory that happened 10 years ago is gonna feel like 10 years old. It's not gonna feel like it happened yesterday. So people who go through trauma, when I gave the example with the World War II veteran, even though it happened 40 years ago, he still had moments and experiences as if it were happening yesterday. So 
So the goal of EMDR is to take the traumatic memory and be able to facilitate adaptive processing so it can be stored. Um, it's important to note that processing is gonna continue after the client leaves the session, which is why it's really important to make sure that they've developed a strong foundation of self-regulation techniques and different coping skills. Um, the memories are stored through five different components. So you have your sensory input, thoughts, emotions, body sensations, and cognitive beliefs. So EMDR takes those five components and addresses all of those throughout treatment. So EMDR is a little bit different than your traditional talk therapy. Um, it uses dual attention stimulation. So we are gonna do an example at the end so you can be able to see what a typical session might look like. But um, EMDR uses components of talk therapy, but also eye movements, which are similar to networks that are activated during REM sleep. So with REM sleep, our brain is very activated. Um, the research suggests that when you pair these eye movements while talking about the traumatic event, the combination allows the individual to have a new way of experiencing the memory that's not threatening, and they call that reciprocal inhibition. Um, other research indicates that the eye movements disrupt the traumatic memory network, so it's kind of sitting frozen, and it helps activate processing it again so that way new information can be allowed to be absorbed. <laughs> So there is a handout that went around that talks about the eight phases of EMDR treatment. There's history, preparation, assessment, desensitization, installation, body scan, closure, and reevaluation. And the worksheet talks a little bit about what each of those phases mean. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to do a demonstration, like Erica was saying, about a piece of a session that EMDR is. Um, so we're going to move the chairs. Can you let me move your chair for you? Yeah. Okay. So um, the phase that we're going to do um, is phase four. You would have to go through the first other phases to get to this point. So again, this is just a very short demonstration, but I want you guys to be able to see what the dual stimulation looks like in a session. All right, so again, I've been working with Kim. Imagine that I've been working with her for a long time. We have a report developed. We've gone through the first three phases, so this is phase four. Hi, Kim, how are you today? Good, how are you doing? Good, I just wanted to do a quick check-in and see how you were doing since our last session. Okay, things, sim things seem to be okay. Um, Good. Not too bad. Yeah. Good, okay. So I just wanted to remind you that during the reprocessing phase, um, we're gonna be doing a simple check as to what's going on, what types of feelings you're experiencing. Um, I'm gonna ask you to give me brief feedback and there's no right or wrong answer. I just want you to be as clear and honest as to what's happening with you okay. without judgment. <laughs> okay. And I also wanted to remind you, do you remember what our stop signal is? You no, just... if you could remind me. <laughs> so if things become too intense, you can just put your hand up and we'll, we'll stop and regroup. Great. Okay, great. So what I'd like you to do is bring up the memory that we've been working on. What is the image that represents the worst part of it as you think about it now? Um, seeing the headlights coming right at me. And what type of emotions are you experiencing? Um, when it happens, I have like a lot of anxiety about it and fear. Okay. And on a scale of zero to 10, how disturbing is it to you right now? Um, I would give it a six, I think, this time. And take a moment, and um, I want you to do your body scan that we practice from head to toe. Where do you feel it in your body right now? I feel a lot in my stomach, and then I also feel like in my chest or in my heart. Okay. That's where I feel it. So I want you to bring to mind the experience, the emotions, and the sensations that you're having now, and follow my fingers. Take a breath, and what do you notice? Um, I feel myself bracing for the impact and shutting my eyes. Focus on that. Okay. Take a breath, and what do you notice? I opened up my eyes and I was happy to be okay. 
Okay. Focus on that. So that's a very, very brief demonstration. Um, typically what would happen is we would continue um, the reprocessing phase until she either has two times where she, it's neutral, like she doesn't experience any new information coming up, um, and then at that point we would start to ask additional questions um, to see if the target memory truly is not as disturbing as it was or if there's additional work that has to be done. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that is our demonstration and our piece of it. Anybody have you want to start questions? Or questions? Back to you if you want, or you can stay. Let me move back. Sure. Yeah. The second question is actually kind of cut off, but since you mentioned it, I figured I'd ask. Um, I've, you know, I've known someone who was a victim of a shooting, and it's been 10, I want to say 10 years, and they still pass a lot of traumatic experiences over it, and they were diagnosed PTSD. Um, my question was, um, he went to Willard Clinic and I had a unfavorable, you know, experience with that person there. They were given medication literally like every two weeks. Um, again, that's just, you know, one personal experience, but it was every two weeks. And I've heard that medications take two weeks to even start having an effect. And we didn't find it helpful. It was like, they were, you know, doing like some type of group therapy, and then those clients were released at night on new meds, and even the time of day, it's, you know, for new meds, yeah, was Difficult. weird. It was released; they were released at night after the session. Do you want to talk about you? So I'm sorry to hear about the unfavorable experience. Um, what I can say is that I don't know that it's on a case by case basis, but typically with trauma doing the therapy and the behavioral health piece of it is crucial. Medication can be helpful, but that's kind of like putting a Band-Aid on something right. that really need, requires like surgery. And trauma work takes quite a bit of time. So often when you see when they're in treatment, things kind of get worse before they get better um, because you're working through your story and you're processing the information. Um, so we really try to encourage clients to try to stick it out as much as they can because um, it is difficult. So. So I guess before I leave, what would you recommend, like at this point, it's been about 10 years, there's moments where you think that person's okay, but then anything can just trigger it back, and like you said, it'll be like yesterday, and at the moment, I think self-medicating is what the person's, well, legally self-medicating, they have now that, you know, miracle marijuana is supposed to be like the new answer. Yeah. Answer. I am very passionate about EMDR. We actually had to practice it when we did the training, so I can truly say that I believe that it works. Um, okay. That is a common therapy for people who have been through trauma. As in a, yeah. So I'd be curious to see like what type of treatment was yeah. specifically identified for that person. Um, and okay. if it wasn't EMDR, I think it would be important to get connected to someone right who specializes in that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Absolutely. thank you. Yeah. Oh, right in front of Trauma focused. Mm -hmm. um, EMDR, it does depend on the individual. I would say an average 12 to 16 sessions, but for some people who have very complex um, childhood trauma, some people have been in it for one or two years. Yeah. As, as adults? Yes. As adults. Yes. Yeah. The amount of sessions, or it's it's pretty much this. Yeah, it's pretty much the same. I mean, there have been um, kids that have been in trauma treatment longer than that. Again, because of depending on what type of trauma they've been exposed to. Um, so it's very similar for adults, I would say. So. Yeah. Medication sometimes? It can be. Um, it can be. And I think, I, I don't know for adults piece of it, but I know for kids it can be combined with it. Mm -hmm. And I think, too, uh, the woman that just left, um, medication is also not for everybody, obviously. Sometimes treatment is better than, than one or the other or both at the same time. Um, and medication does take a little bit of time to get within the system and work, too. So it's important that if there's any issues with that to express that with your provider, too. But um, I don't know if you want to talk about the adult piece with the medication, if you feel like that's beneficial to have with the treatment. It's the same. It's on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. I mean, there are some people that go through the treatment and aren't on medi any medication whatsoever, but others do need yeah. some type of mood stabilizer. 
Yeah. <laughs> As for during like the EMDR um, treatment, what is like the environment like? Like, is it home? Is it in your own home? Is it somewhere else? Is it outside? Because I know sometimes environmental situations also can trigger trauma trauma from the inside. Yeah, like where they are. This yeah, the yeah. sense. Yep, absolutely. So um, EMDR is typically done in the office, but people do go in home and do this therapy as well. And now they get to choose that, right? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, wherever that person is more comfortable. So if it's an office-based setting like Wheeler, obviously they'd come to the office. Right. But if it was in-home work, if they were more comfortable being in the kitchen versus the family room, because maybe that's where the event happened, then that's what they could do. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Good. Other questions? Yeah. Right over here. Do you find that there's many practitioners that do EMDR? Um, I have actually like looked into it before, and it seems like I think it, I can't remember the acronym, but ITAP um, trauma. Specials. What is it? I wanted to say it was ITAP, or so, it was like um, people that are specifically trained. HAP Recovery Network. H A P. Mm -hmm. But it seemed like it was only like three or four people on this list, and for all of Connecticut. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the availability of EMDR. It is absolutely growing. Um, so there is a difference. Some therapists are trained but haven't received the official certification, so there could be differences in that. And what that means, to become certified, you go through a certain number of supervision sessions. Um, you have to have a certain number of documented client contact hours practicing the model. Um, but I do believe that people who are trained in it, they do go through a vigorous <laughs> training. So either one. But check again. <laughs> <laughs> I could also provide you with resources. Um, now, during the intake session, do you guys just do the intake and then suggest EMDR or whatever, or do you have some people just want EMDR and just go into it? Yeah, um, so typically what we do is when we have a client coming in, we meet with them and, like you said, do an intake session. So we gather all information about their history, you know, um, if they have any history of suicide risk, homicide risk, all of, all of their basic information. And then after we do our assessment, then we determine if EMDR or trauma-focused therapy uh, would be beneficial for them. And then we either would treat them or we would connect them to someone who's trained in that to do that treatment. So, And some people benefit from group sessions. Some people benefit from individual sessions. It just depends on what's going on with them. So. But is there any clients that actually come in and they're like, I need EMDR? Yes. 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 Because they know from other people that maybe have gone through it and have experience. So yes, they do ask for that. And we still assess just to make sure it's appropriate. So. Anybody else have any other questions? I have a bit of a different question. Sure. Um, so I keep thinking of the Sandy Hook shooting and, and the after effects of that. And one of the things that to me is shocking is the conspiracy theories associated with it. Uh, most prominent among those are the ones perpetrated by Alex Jones. I don't know if anyone here knows Alex Jones, but he's probably the, the most significant vocal, yes. uh, person who circulated this idea that it was all a hoax, or it was an inside job. So my question is, to what extent does post-trauma get compounded by things like that to have uh, the, the victim's family not only experience the death of a loved one, but to also hear that it wasn't real, that it didn't really happen, and that they were actually actors that were part of it. We hear this with the Parkland shootings, too. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if this is a, a double kind of post-trauma. How does yeah, that I work? Mean, so Sandy Hook, obviously, it definitely did happen. Um, and like I said, I was down there with a group of people, and it's not a hoax. There weren't actors. Um, there were people who truly lost their children or their parents or teachers, um, and it definitely did happen. Um, I think when those type of things come out with the conspiracy theories and that specific person making those comments, um, I think for people who have lost someone, it's more out of um, anger about it and just not understanding how someone could come up with that idea and feel that it's okay to provide that to the media and other people. Um, but I also think a lot of people um, who experienced it too 
didn't really pay attention to it. So it kind of went both ways. Um, and I think with trauma, especially with a school shooting and having a, you know, a child who was lost in a school shooting, those specific families, I think more than anybody would just continue to move on and do what they need to do to advocate and grieve. Um, so, but it did happen. <laughs> if anybody has any questions, it, it did happen. Any other questions that you guys have? Yeah, um, so this is gonna be two questions. One is in relation to the media and how do you think um, being potentially exposed to news about an incident over and over again affects a victim? Uh, and the other one is what do you think can be done to address the potential for somebody to turn into a shooter before it happens? Um, because I see you listed some of the research that's been done. And um, I mean, I wasn't very social when I was in middle school and high school. And I did a lot of those things. Um, but I found that as time progressed, I was able to change. I was able to make friends and create that support group. So I feel like there must be more to why these children turn to what they turn to. Mm -hmm. Talk to the first part. Um, so to answer the first part of your question, absolutely. So Kim briefly mentioned during the presentation vicarious trauma. So what that means is developing traumatic symptoms from things like the news, the media, um, kind of like third party, so to speak. Um, trauma is absolutely not limited to military, which is a common belief from years ago. It, it manifests in many different ways, shapes, and forms. And I know that, again, we weren't, you know, directly impacted, but we were there providing support. And I know some of my coworkers and staff, when things come on about Sandy Hook, some of them can't watch it because it's just sad for them and it's hard for them to be able to cope with that, knowing their stories and trying to help. Um, so sometimes people try to shut themselves off from the media because a lot of the times it just, it's a memory and it reminds you of those, those events that came up. So imagine how a parent is dealing with that every time seeing that on the news and how they are affected by it too. Um, but answering your second question about trying to figure out if there's other things to do, I think you were saying, or how else to notice um, behaviors. Is that what you were saying? To Remind me. Spot, try to prevent a child who's clearly in a bad space from moving forward with a potential like destructive plan. Um, maybe seeing if schools can push more for having kids reach out to one another and not allowing kids to isolate themselves. So when you spot a kid that is regularly uh, not participating in group activities, who's choosing to display signs that might be alarming, yeah. to, yep. to have them m more communicative with resources within the school so that they can be treated. Uh, I don't know if this is something you guys talk about. Yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right, and I think you have those are actually suggestions in what you're saying. So I think um, you are seeing some schools going towards directions of, I don't know if you guys have seen on the news recently, but there was an elementary school that has like a friendship bench, what they call it. And if the child sits there and they feel lonely or sad or don't feel like they have a friend to play with that recess that day, then the kids know to go over there and sit with them and talk with them and engage them in some act, type of activity. So that's the younger child side, which some schools are trying to do to involve. Um, I think overall with kids and adolescents, I think there's some lack of education about mental health sometimes within school systems, and some school systems are really on top of it and can pick up signs and symptoms of students and are very aware of their kids and know their kids really well, and some schools struggle in that area. Um, so I think education would be really beneficial for a lot of schools. Um, myself and then Jill, um, who works with us, she, her and I are trainers for youth mental health and first aid, um, and where we actually have gone out to schools in different systems and taught people about what it is to experience mental health, depression, anxiety, and psychosis and really being able to pick up on signs and symptoms and behaviors of kids and adolescents. Um, so we've always kind of pushed for trainings on that. I think schools would really benefit from that to be able to identify those kids that are really struggling. So I hope that answers, somewhat answers your question, maybe? It's complicated. Okay, I don't know if that answers some of it. But I appreciate it. Yeah. So my question for you guys is obviously there's, you know, different types of trauma ranging from like all different things and 
by no means am I saying, you know, putting anyone's trauma down, but you know, there's car accident trauma or like war trauma, like you're saying. So my question would be is what do you guys have to say on like, if you're a person who has been through trauma and it's not necessarily something as serious as war trauma, like um, me personally, like a car accident, I was in a car accident, you know, a couple months ago. Is it still, like, for me, is it still worth, like, going to talk Absolutely. to someone, or is that, like... If it's still impacting you where you're having, like, you know, current thoughts about it or nightmares or anything like that, absolutely. If you... I think it's important if it's continued to long-lasting and you have those effects, it's important to talk to somebody about it. And it's not, like, a lifetime thing. It could just be something that you need in that moment to be able to process and work through it. So... The symptoms are present no matter how they got there. And so I always try and emphasize that because then I have heard other people express some of the same um, questions about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I have a question based on, so you guys deal with so many people who go through so many traumatic experiences. Do you guys sometimes feel like you go home and you're affected personally? <laughs> because I know like sometimes when you're with a friend who's telling you about all this stuff going through and you kind of, I know I take it home personally and I'm just like, I'm always thinking about it, and I'm always trying to figure out ways to kind of fix the situation. But I know you guys hear about multiple a day. Yeah. So, like, does that take a toll on you? or? So self-care is crucial <laughs> in this field. Yes. Absolutely. Um, and I can't speak to you, but when I went to graduate school, we actually had to meet with a therapist so we could become comfortable with that and, and deal with any of our own issues and whatnot. So I think um, creating that groundwork, and I know a lot of graduate programs do that, also makes it m more comfortable as a professional or an adult to seek out those services if needed. But self-care is big. Chocolate, cookies, stuff like that helps. <laughs> um, but self-care is big. We try to encourage that in ourselves, but also our staff too, because obviously you deal with a lot. But you know, our goal is to help the clients that we're working with. Um, but yes, we do experience some that ourselves. So, like, my mom works with um, the ju judicial portion of the state, and she sees client cases day in, day out of yeah. homicides and this and that. And she comes home, and she, her mood is completely affected. And I feel as though almost she should be taking a part in something like this just to kind of get that stuff off of her chest and, like, relieve herself from all the traumatic yeah. things she's been hearing about all day. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if that's beneficial, I mean, it's worth looking into, I guess, you know. And it's nice if you have somebody that's a neutral support, like a friend or someone that you can talk to without sharing a lot of information, that helps too. But if she needs like an outlet, who's someone who's neutral, definitely suggest it. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a question uh, that kind of relates back to what Jake was asking as well, because as he said, I think it's complicated. So being a faculty member here at the college, and there's a bunch of us in the room, um, you know, we're aware of our students and what they're going through sometimes. Sometimes they open up, sometimes they don't. So a lot of times I feel that kind of recovery and trauma has, it's like a 50-50, right, if the student's willing to come up. So could you talk a little bit about that in terms of, you know, willingness to be helped, opening up, and so forth and so on, because I think that's key. If a student is maybe introverted and doesn't want to open up and doesn't want to talk about it, you know, there's. Um, Are you asking for I'm like suggestions for. of what to? Do no, um, okay. you know, it's like uh, your privacy, right? You can't go past that line. Yeah. So if a student is isn't forthcoming, right? Um, there's a sort of like you got to keep your boundaries there. So that's I think an issue, especially kind of in our role as faculty. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that in terms of, you know, if someone is in that situation, what can we do in that role or what can the student to kind of give a signal to someone that, you know, they want to take it further? I absolutely um, think having, being knowledgeable about resources in the area for behavioral health professionals is really important um, because while a family, faculty, or friend can absolutely be supportive, sometimes there is that, where does that boundary lie in terms of a person being comfortable to um, share? And also with behavioral health professionals, they're trained to ask the uncomfortable questions, assess for if somebody's suicidal, if they've been feeling homicidal. Um, so I always encourage that. 
charge that too, yeah. yeah. And I think, I mean, if you notice that someone has been struggling recently, maybe they're not engaged as much in class, they seem to be falling asleep a lot, um, maybe their typical mood is not what it has been, It's. I think it's okay to pull them and say, hey, I noticed that there's been a little bit of change and you, you fell asleep in class yesterday, is everything okay? And try to break that silence because I think if so, they know that someone cares and that they're noticing, that's important, you know? So just starting that dialogue. Back, I think. So this isn't necessarily a question. It's kind of just bouncing off what Professor Machado said. Um, but I mean, you guys can agree, disagree, put your opinion in on this. But personally, as a student, I think, um, like I said, I have I went through some family things and it was very traumatic for me. And, you know, I'm not afraid to say that I did go and talk someone and it did help me. But I think, um, like, coming from a professor's point of view or even an adult figure in a student's life, it really, really, really helps to have someone come to you and say, you know, like you said, yeah. hey, you fell asleep in class today. Is everything yeah. okay? Yep, absolutely. Because, um, you know, you are kind of afraid to say something, you know, you could be afraid, you're embarrassed, things like that. Um, but like I said, from my personal experience, you know, I had that one teacher who came to me and said, you like, you haven't said a word in class for a week, like what's going on? So, and they noticed that. Yeah. Right. So I think being the person in the situation who doesn't want to come out and talk about it, it's a really, really supportive and good thing to hear that someone Noticed, kind of yeah. comes to yeah. you Absolutely. and says something, so. Anybody else have any other questions? Oh, back. Absolutely. Um, she has so, one. My question is, oh. how do you know someone is traumatized? Like at what point you know that someone needs at, uh, treatment? Or even if it's in case of you, how do you know you need attention right now? I think by the only way to determine that is by talking to a professional because they'll be able to do um, an in-depth assessment to evaluate what types of symptoms you're having and to see if treatment would be helpful. But I think if you're questioning it, I would absolutely err on the side of caution and say I would see somebody. Good question. Yeah, it was um, just thinking back to what you said about how if the person is having severe signs of trauma that, mm -hmm. you know, the... Um, MDR can be counterindicated. Um, is there a process to you work through them? Like, is it an option further down? You know, um, is there a process that you would get through to maybe move them to that? Absolutely. Um, so some of the, what I talked about earlier was, right, levels of dissociation. And the reason why um, that would have to be addressed first is because if somebody's too far removed from reality, they're not going to be able to facilitate the reprocessing in their brain. Um, a couple of the other contraindications, which again, it's not permanent. As long as it gets stabilized, then EMDR can begin. Um, if somebody's just got out of being hospitalized for inpatient, if they're an immediate risk to themselves or somebody else, we would want to make sure that's addressed. And then the same thing with substance. There's, there's a wide range, and it's a case-by-case -case basis. But if somebody's substance use is so bad where it's imminently life-threatening, we would want to tackle that first. Absolutely. Stable first. Yes. Yeah, medically. And then you yeah. can start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so my uh, best friend, she, I know she has mental illness and she has a trauma, but her insurance doesn't cover mental health and her family can't afford to pay for it. So do you guys have a payment plan or some way of getting other payments so that she can go to therapy? Absolutely. Yes. Um, so specifically for Wheeler Clinic, we have a sliding scale fee is what we do, and it's based off on income and what the family makes. So absolutely, I encourage anybody to go to the clinic if they'd like to, to, to get connected to a therapist, and they'll work out a payment plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. Yes. I'd like to add that um, to Emily's question, kind of respond to what you just said. We also have services on campus. So in the 100 building, uh, there's the advising slash counseling area. So if that's a question or you don't know what to do or who to speak with, 
that's available, and I know that they work very closely with the Wheeler Clinic yep. and so, other services, so that's always a good option here on campus. So like I had said earlier, I oversee um, mobile crisis intervention <coughs> services through Wheeler for kids and adults, um, and even if someone doesn't have insurance, we still provide treatment to that family and get them connected to treatment. And then the adult side of it is um, no longer Wheeler, but it's uh, CRT, which is, uh, not CRT, I'm sorry, CMHA, mm -hmm. which is in New Britain, and they are the exact same way. Um, so if the person doesn't have insurance for the adult side, they'll still respond out and provide treatment. So just so you guys know that, we can give some of the information to you all to pass along. So I know as far as um, people who go through the traumatic experience, there's also people in their lives who, in a way, they're affecting as well. Um, and I know, I know someone personally who kind of is taking a lot of the brunt of what someone else is going through. And it's honestly affecting them because now they're getting anxiety, depression, they're upset. So now what, how does that go as far as them getting help because they're not the one that went through the traumatic experience, although they're getting the symptoms and signs of someone who has gone through one. So I think that speaks to the vicarious trauma piece. So even if you're hearing through it through a third party in person or through media on TV, um, that absolutely qualifies as a, a type of trauma. Now, would the treatment be different? considering it's not your technically traumatic experience? It could be. It depends on the person, um, but it could be, yeah. It's still worth, I think, even in that situation, consulting, with, talking with somebody about it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> well, thank you guys for having us. I don't know if you want to do some closing remarks, but we appreciate you guys having us here and being able to talk about, about this topic. Well, that that was great. You know, after events like these, we try to figure out if we want the same kind or a similar kind of event to happen again. And I can say we don't need to discuss that. This was great. And just by the, the, the presentations and the questions that were asked, obviously there's a need to have an event like this. So so we appreciate you coming here. Absolutely. This is wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Before you go, I'd also like to recognize Ira Mazil here because he's the one who really put this all together and he was instrumental in bringing uh, these two experts uh, to Tunxis and, and to organizing the event. So, so we have a lot to, to thank him for. So thank you, Ira. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> He not only teaches public speaking here and interpersonal communication, he's very good at that from what I've heard, although I've never seen it personally. Uh, but uh, he is working with the Civic Engagement Institute and has done great work for us. And he's able to bring in different, different people, different experts, and, and this is the result. So thanks again. Thank you. All right. And that uh, closes uh, the presentation. Thank you again, and uh, you, enjoy the rest of the day.